Hi, everybody. Sinead here from the National Menopause Summit and welcome to another chapter of Menopause Supports. I'm so excited and honoured today to be chatting to the wonderful Mariella Frostrup. Mariella um, is our international keynote speaker at the National Menopause Summit, which I think everyone at this point knows takes place on the 11th and 12th of April at the Aviva Stadium this year. And Mariella worked with us at the National Menopause Summit Cork, um, as our international keynote and made such a great contribution to the day and, and everybody really enjoyed her story. She is a titan of menopause awareness. Um, she does a huge amount of work in terms of spreading word and factual information and heightening the whole subject of menopause. So we're really honoured to have an opportunity to chat with her today, pre coming over to Dublin in April. So good morning, Mariella. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Good morning, Sinead. I might actually nick that line from you and maybe get it on my gravestone. A titan of menopause. <laughs> way to go. Way to go. I'm At nothing. Last, I'm, something... I'm nothing if I'm not dramatic, Mariella. That's all I will say. <laughs> I love a bit of hyperbole when it's attached to achievements. <laughs> Absolutely. So um just I suppose very briefly for people who don't know, obviously you're 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 half or two-thirds or one third of an Irish woman yourself anyway. Do you want to give us all a sense of um of how that is or why that is? Well, I do consider myself about two thirds Irish. Unfortunately, the passport office don't at the moment. But nevertheless, uh, moving on from that, I did actually, we moved to Ireland when I was six. My father was Norwegian, my mother was Scottish, but we yes. moved to Ireland uh, when I was six and I did all of my schooling in Ireland uh, up to the intermediate certificate as it was oh, wow. called then. Yes. Um, and uh, and then I left school altogether. My father died. I left school altogether. Family life was a bit troubled. And um, and I moved to London um, in an effort to sort of put all that behind me um, yeah. and now find that, sadly, it was Ireland I put behind me, really. Oh. Um, but, you know, I still feel very connected. I've still got great friends there. I still come over at least once or twice a year. So, um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I, I live in Somerset now, which I could, I could literally, I could probably abseil across. Oh! My light's gone out. Um, that's okay. I could literally, I don't know, but that's weird. I could literally abseil across and, oh, I think my electricity's gone. No way. Well, so can I stop for one minute? Of course, I'm going to. Oh, is it, is it okay? Hi guys, we're having a few technical issues, but we're back. So that's absolutely grand. So yeah, Mariella, you were saying you could abseil across to Ireland, basically where you live. Yeah, absolutely. And and even the drive to Bristol Airport just looks like Ireland. So I suppose I've got, you know, a little bit of both now. But um, I do very much miss being there. And frankly, any opportunity to get over, uh, I grab it. But this is just such a spectacular one, because like you were saying, you know, the sort of electricity in that room in, in Cork. I mean, there's nothing more exciting than a, a room full of Irish women and a room full of Irish women animated and maybe a little bit angry about what's occurred. Um, is actually more exciting still. Oh yeah, no, it's it, it's fabulous. It's very unique, um, and we're just delighted and honoured to 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 work on it. It's it really is a wonderful project to work on. And and again, you know, if somebody'd asked me ten years ago, you know, or or even suggested this would be happening, of course, menopause wasn't an issue for me ten years ago, and certainly wasn't an issue that anybody was really talking about ten years ago. So it's always um, it's always interesting how our 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 lives on on sort of unfold over time and on that subject of course you had had previously still do obviously but the coolest career on the planet <laughs> tell everybody about live aid and don't pretend it's not cool because it is cool now stop it no listen the problem with telling you about live aid is as i discovered the other day because it was the anniversary and um and i was asked to do this program that they have on on bbc radio 4 over here um called the reunion you know and it was mm. they had bob and they had you know a dj guy and they had uh gary kemp and they had you know they had a bunch oh, of people cool. yeah. uh, all involved in um both band aid and live aid and um, and they kept asking me to do it and i was like i can't i don't remember anything <laughs> No. And and the truth is, you know, I spent band aid. I remember a bit, you know, because I, I basically I came from from Ireland at sixteen, and by the time I was eighteen, I'd got a job at this record company called Phonogram. Mm. So I started working in the music business, and uh, Bob was one of the people who I was promoting as a PR. So that's how I ended up involved in it. To cut a very very long story short, um. 
But Band-Aid, I sort of remember because it was very unusual. You know, it was a Sunday morning. And we were in this recording studio in West London. And then all of these just megastars started sort of slipping quietly in the door. We'd never seen them in the mornings anyway, because they were mostly like vampires, you know, up at night. So that was unusual in it in itself. But Live Aid, I mean, it was such a huge event. Hmm. The weeks preceding it was so hectic just trying to kind of get the finishing touches put together and on the day all I did was roam the corridors of Wembley Arena trying to like match musicians up to you know musicians errant musicians in fact up yeah. to journalists so we could get a bit of publicity uh, around it so I don't think I I'm not sure that I even saw one act wow let alone all yeah. of them um but you know, it was this, it was the sort of beginning, really, of 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 what's become you know my career in 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 the media. And over the course of it, um, maybe slightly because I'm a woman, I have been at every given point a different version. So I've been sort of music Mariella, and then book Mariella, and yeah, then yeah. film Mariella, and yeah. then you know, and so on and so forth. I finally think um, now, you know, at the age of uh, sixty, I'm finally allowed to have varied interests rather than be, you know, defined by one of them, which is an interesting thing that maybe we'll be talking about when we're in Dublin, which is that sense of, you know, finally coming into yourself oh, um, in middle yeah. age and beyond. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Because as you know, Mariella, from working with us in Cork, uh, we've got amazing speakers yourself included, loads of fact based information. But the the narrative that underpins the whole summit, because it is it's it's it literally the whole thing was born out of my experience of menopause was it's not over, ladies. In fact, this can be once you get your symptoms under control and there nobody's suggesting that that's an easy road or an easy journey. This can be an incredibly freeing and creative time of your life because you're less concerned with what people think and now you can kind of go off and hopefully without sounding all airy fairy about it follow your own passions and your own dreams and I know you're very pro that Mariella I certainly am and I certainly got a sense of that in our uh, Dublin at our Dublin and Cork summits um last year but uh, just on the topic of documentary Mariella okay so you obviously did the you know one of the very first documentaries on menopause for the BBC back in 2018 so can you give us a sense of your menopause journey and what inspired you to produce that documentary well, I mean, I think my menopause journey echoes the menopause journey of, of many women, hopefully less and less um, mm. as we carry on uh, campaigning. But I mean, I was totally pig ignorant. I had no idea really um, uh, about what was happening to me or indeed about menopause in general. I mean, it was a word I'd heard. Mm. Um, I figured it happened. It happened, this thing, mm. um, as around 50. Um but I had no idea really, no concept of, of what the thing was. And so when in my late forties, I started experiencing really for the first time in my life, terrible crippling anxiety, particularly mm. manifesting itself at night along with, and obviously contributing to terrible insomnia as well. I just thought, I thought I was losing the plot. You know, I, I had no, I had no, um, kind of, you know, hinterland uh, mm -hmm. with which to, you know, place these symptoms in. And so I spent a couple of years, you know, really, really suffering, finding it very difficult to do my job. My, I had my kids quite late, so they were quite young. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was a pretty bleak period of my life. And I think, you know, it, it took that couple of years and quite a few visits to various doctors and finally, you know, uh, you know, a good doctor, but but still not in any way trained in menopause to kind mm. of go, this isn't really working, is it? I think I need to send you to a to a real specialist. And I was like, yes, I think you do. Yeah. And um, and finally, you know, I found myself in the in the um surgery of, of of this gynecologist, brilliant Northern Irish gynecologist called Sarah Matthews, um, who works here in London. And you know, within five minutes, she just went well, we can't have you feeling like that. And I mean, the tears were rolling down my cheeks. Mm. It was like, you know, suddenly I was being seen mm. uh, in, in in a way that I really hadn't felt uh, I was seen at all by the long line of, of medical professionals that I'd um, attempted to consult on it over the preceding two years. 
And, you know, the really, I suppose, heartening thing about it is that once uh, there was someone there saying, you are perimenopausal, I don't care what the blood test says because your hormones are going up and down yeah. like yo-yos. So a blood test is a very unreliable way of, of, of being informed. And, you know, they really shouldn't use them as the defining characteristic because I, I, I was told I was peri, I was post, and I wasn't menopausal at all in the course yeah. of those two years based on on blood tests. Um, and she said to me, well, the first thing we need to do is send you off for a bone density scan. And I was like, how's that going to help with the anxiety and the insomnia, you know? And it was only at that point that I began this very long journey of discovery in terms of what menopause and particularly perimenopause, because up until that point, I don't think I'd even heard the word perimenopause. I think a lot of people and have yeah and 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 that frankly you know when you dig into it is the most important period of all because it's when all of the things are happening to your body that you're completely unaware of you know you might be suffering debilitating symptoms but you don't really know the sort of internal damage that can be going on Indeed. and the reason she she said the first thing you need to do is the bone density scan is because that is of course one of one of the most insidious ways in which this catastrophic drop in hormones can affect us. And there are so many women of my mother and my mother-in-law's generation who basically, um, you know, have osteoporosis or are on the cusp of osteoporosis as a result of not being offered HRT. So, you know, that was the beginning of, you know, what's been a kind of decade long journey into finding out what it really is, why it was considered so shameful, why people would go silent at dinner parties if I mentioned the word, which only increased my determination to dig in further and persuade the BBC to make the documentary. And you were you mentioned um, Mariella um, down in Cork that actually you uh, lost some work through all of your work with, you know, with uh, advocating for and raising awareness of menopause. Now, I know we all kind of can um, can connect with the whole idea of of society being unbelievably ageist but um do you want to tell us a little bit about that yeah I mean I wouldn't I wouldn't say that there were specific jobs that I lost as a result but one of the things that was quite interesting was that the, the minute I started campaigning the minute I started being very vocal about it um you know obviously doing the sort of job that I do, you get offered quite a lot of commercial work, you know, mm. advertising and things. And the minute I became associated uh, with menopause in any shape or form, I'd say for the first couple of years, this is, you know, a good Asia or nine years ago, for mm. the first couple of years, the phone did not ring. And, you know, I think it's important to remember now uh, when we're in a position where I think we really can, um, you know, shout it from the rooftops without fear of, of shame or of being penalised in the workplace as a result of it. Uh, I think it's important to remember that, you know, a decade ago and for all of prehistory before that, you know, this was a time in women's lives that the rest of the world, and that means, frankly, the patriarchy, uh, yeah. considered completely unmentionable. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we feel now that we're in this brave new world and, and things have changed enormously. But the amount that still needs to be done in terms of normalising, not just menopause, to be honest, but every stage of women's biological journey, you know, mm -hmm. It seems so obvious in many ways, but it seems so far out of reach in 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 others that men's bodies have been used as the benchmark for everything to do with our health, yep. to do with medical trials. The 70 kilo man is the prototype. Yeah. And anything that differs from that is seen as unusual or complicated or off the mark. And you know, to me, I think that the, the game changer has to be that women's bodies, you know, frankly, our bodies are essential to the future of the species, as we know. Whether you choose to have children or you don't, the fact that we can and we do carry children makes us completely indispensable. And yet the way in which our body works is treated as a sort of add-on and often, you know, concessionary um 
uh, you know, decisions are made about how when you all here have a fan, you might be feeling a bit hot. You yeah. know, I'm I'm absolutely like up to here with the idea of, you know, the tiny little concessions that are made for women in the workplace. I honestly think that, you know, it's why I started the Women in Work Summit. We, we need a full scale revolution. You know, we need to actually change the, 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 the baseline on which all of this is focused. Oh, I couldn't agree more, uh, Mary Ellen. I'm just keeping a little eye on the time there for you. Um, Obviously, as you know, with the with the with the National Menopause Summit in Ireland and again, born of my own um, experience and and then thankfully, when I put it together, resonated, as it turns out, with everybody. Half the summit is about um, menopause in the workplace and half the summit is about um, uh, delivering information on the journey through menopause. So more of the clinical aspects of it, because I suffered from crippling brain fog to the point where I really believed I was de developing early onset dementia. And I said to Shell, my colleague and great friend and co-director on the summit who you've met in the summer of 2020, I'm done. You need to get yourself a new business partner. And by the way, I'm not saying that in a trite way. That was it. I couldn't manage my diary, Mariella, let alone put together events with 1,200 people at them or or, or in our case, even 100,000 people at them because we work in festivals and events for years. So, um, you know, it was really, really important to me that a very strong message advocating for workplace supports across Irish organisations, whether they're private, semi-state, public whatever and that 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 was something that we um that we included at the summit because as we all know we're all working now this wasn't an issue certainly in Ireland it wasn't an issue 40 years ago because you weren't allowed work as a married woman uh, but it's absolutely an issue now because obviously work is such a huge part of our lives so it's incredibly important we did a survey Mariella recently the menopause survey 2024 national menopause summit obviously and um we'd over 850 respondents and 53 percent oh. of people said that their employers do not offer uh supports in that regard um and i think something like uh 23 percent said they did okay so if we want to be we want to be positive for a moment. That's 23% more than we're doing possibly pre-COVID. But certainly things need to start moving way faster in that regard. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I mean, you know, we've had a breakthrough announcement um, this week in the UK, mm -hmm. which is that um, women in work, I mean, there are new, there's new guidance basically from the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. And um, it, it it says that, you know, employers have to provide support uh, for women um, going through perimenopause and menopause. Um, but in order to hold them to account to do that, we have to use disability laws that are already in place. Mm -hmm. And as you can imagine, you know, talk about, a, a, you know, we have to accentuate the positive, which is that finally, you know, the realisation that women deserve and need support mm -hmm. just during this liminal phase of our lives. Well, that's great. And I have to say, you know, that's positive. But for it to have to be done through the back door, as it mm -hmm. were, mm -hmm. uh, and by being covered by disability legislation, I think it's just an outrage. I think it's an in insult to disabled people for a start that yeah. this, you know, passing phase of our lives should be should be considered as a as a disability when there are people out there who really, you know, need a, a very different level of of support. But I also think it plays to that thing that we were just talking about, which is that we are considered abnormal. Yeah. All of the things that impact us are considered abnormal. I know it's insane. And 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 therefore, you know, we really need consideration for menopause, um, you know, in the workplace. We need to start from the very beginning. I mean, are, are they saying that periods are a disability or pregnancy? I mean, where does it stop or where does it start? You know, right. and I, I think that 23% is great. And my goodness, you know, it, it probably would have been 3% uh, mm -hmm. 10 years ago. And, you know, a lot of it is down to people uh, like you doing the campaigning you're doing and, and bringing awareness to it. But I, I think it's very easy if you operate in the sort of middle echelons of life, you know, the sort of middle classes where we talk about a lot about these things and we have access to a lot of information. But I think the level at which things haven't changed mm -hmm. Mm. is really, really um, sobering. And, you know, the reason that events like yours are incredibly important is that 
every time you put on something like that, it filters out just that little bit further into exactly. society. Exactly. You know, I know there are huge groups of women here in the UK who still, you know, the whole discussion about menopause hasn't reached yet. And it's easy to be complacent and kind of think, oh, my. you know, I hear people saying to me, oh, here she goes on again about menopause. Mm -hmm. But actually, I, I, you know, I won't be patronized because I think it's desperately important and not just to me and my generation and not just to my daughter, but for all the girls who come along behind us who need to have their very, very basic um, fertility journey through life recognized in the workplace, women aren't going back to the domestic sphere. You know, yes. we're out and loud and proud in the working world and we intend to stay here. Absolutely. So actually it's time it was shaped around us. No, I agree. And I'm very conscious, Mariella, that we're running out of time, but I will just make one comment before we do. I have done a number of interviews, obviously, on radio and TV and all the rest here in relation to the summit. And um, a lovely um, interviewer, he's fabulous, down in Cork, in the run into the Cork Summit, a lovely person, had a great chat with him on the radio, said to me, Sinead, why do you think there is so much shame associated around menopause? Now, we were talking about Ireland specifically, and I said to him, well, PJ, there has been historical shame associated with the female life cycle, particularly in this country. I know globally to a degree as well for many, many years. I said, but here's the thing, PJ, we're not going to wear it anymore. The genie's out of the lamp. We're not going to shove it back in and everyone needs to get with the program. We're 50 percent of the world population. This is what happens as part of our natural life cycle. Sorry, lads, just all going to have to get with it. And it's as simple as that. And he was like, no, absolutely. I completely agree with you. So, you know, that's my um, that's certainly my message. I know it's your message. Um, and um, yeah, so onwards and upwards, you know, we're making progress. But of course, we're, we want to we want to make progress, Marielle, at warp speed, as we know. But we're we're we're, 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 we're... We, we need to make progress at warp speed because we've got an awful lot of time to make up for. Do you Absolutely. know, we're millennia Absolutely. during Absolutely. which women's bodies have been sidelined, you know, on every level and misdiagnosed and misrepresented by the very sex, of course, that yeah. wouldn't be going through any of those things because they always knew better. And yeah. um yeah, I, I I just think this is really, really important. And I'm so excited to be coming well, we uh, to are, Dublin to talk about it some more. We are so excited to see you in Dublin. And it's only a number of weeks away now. I can't believe that. Um, so look, I'll wrap up by saying, Mariella, again, thank you so much for your time this morning. We really, really appreciate it. And um, have a lovely weekend. And uh, Shalok, we'll see you very shortly over at the Aviva Stadium in, in April. Well, thank you so much. And sorry about the technical hitches and the lack of a ring light. I'm probably scaring small children. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> you look beautiful. I'll talk to you soon, Mariella. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Sinead. Thank you very much.